This is a team that generally is conservative. Now, I say that knowing that in the past, when they've had a chance, they've gone for it. Let's do this. It's the Inside Scoop. It is the big week. FT Senior Insider Ken Rosendahl with us right now. What are you oh, doing? That's cute. That's cute. They match. match. Oh, they match. They match. Oh, you guys oh, called match. each other. That's so cute. Oh, brothers. I love that. So maybe we'll ask AJ for all the trade questions. No, anyway, there's a great <laughs> article put out by Ken this morning in The Athletic about six particular players and what should be done with them. So, Ken, do you want to pick a player or two? And actually, you know what? I want to start with Scoobal just because I feel like that's the theme of the day for me. I've been backing the fact that I don't think the Tigers should be doing this to their fan base if they think this is a healthy number one starter. What did you write about and what do you think? I agree with you, Scott, and that's what I wrote. And I get that Tarek Skubal in this market, that a star for starting pitching, could bring you a great deal. But my goodness, you're the Detroit Tigers. You're essentially a mid-market team. You're starting to play better. You, not so long ago, under the late owner, Mike Illich, carried top five payrolls. Now, you're not going to sign Skubal to an extension. He's represented by Scott Boris, and we all know how that goes. But here's a guy that in the next two years that you have him under control, you can reasonably envision making the playoffs with, and that should be the goal. This is a team that's had a lot of losing seasons in a row, and let's go. It's time for them to go forward. Now, you can make the case that if they could get enough, say, from the Orioles in terms of position players, hitters that they need, that they could still go forward in a big way. But, man, you have the guy who is the leading candidate for the American League Cy Young Award, who some believe should have started the All-Star game, and you're going to trade him with two years of control left? That, to me, is just a give-up type move, and it's not one the Tigers should be making. Is he too valuable? Is he so valuable that like it, it doesn't make it possible? Or is there a scenario where it could happen? I would say he's too valuable, and he's too good to trade for major league-ready position players who might be really good. And you're not getting Jackson Holiday for Tarek Skubal, okay? Two more years of Scooble, six more of Jackson Holiday, a position player who is more reliable in terms of his physical health. Pitchers get hurt more frequently than position players. So that's not happening. So you're not getting that. You might get something good from the Orioles. Maybe you get some of their second-tier guys or even second-tier guys that other teams would consider first-tier. But to me, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. And I know there's going to be a ton of speculation in the next week, and who knows? I've been wrong before. Maybe they do it. But in my opinion, that's not something that they should do. Trade Jack Flaherty? Yes, of course. Potential free agent. Trade Mark Canna? Absolutely. But trading a guy like this, who is the leader of your staff, who can vault you in a weak division to perhaps a division title in the next two years or perhaps just a postseason berth, I don't know why you would do that. First of all, the AL Central says they're not weak anymore, Ken, but that's besides the point. Is this a trade that uh, – needs to happen in the offseason because I said earlier we talked about this like usually these big trades they don't happen at the trade deadline they happen in the offseason or right when the season you know the, the the Dylan cease right before the season's about to start because they have more time to sit down at the winter meetings and they have more time to assess farm system with their scouts and all that so is this a trade that could happen in the offseason not mainly this season well AJ, you make a good point. This is not the only window to trade Tarek Skubal, just as it's not the only window for the White Sox to trade Crochet or Luis Robert Jr. Now, trades are somewhat more common in the offseason simply because rosters are more flexible. If you're acquiring position players, you can do things and not disrupt your current team. But at the same time, I'm not sure they should trade him in the offseason either for all the reasons I just stated. This is a guy to build around. It's the rarest of things. Justin Steele is in the same category. How often now do we talk about the lack of ace-type pitchers in the game today? How difficult they are to develop, how difficult they are to acquire, how difficult they are to retain. Well, you've got one. Keep him. And I know there's a physical risk here. Scoobles had a Tommy John in 2017. He had flexor tendon surgery in 22. There's always going to be risk. But my gosh, you've got a guy who every fifth day gives you a really good chance to win. That's a heck of a starting point for any team. All right, you wrote an article about Mason Miller, and it felt like you said you thought maybe they would deal him. I think it's the no, opposite. That's not of what I said. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. All right, I'm putting but words I, in I, your I, mouth. Let me clarify what I said. And the gist of the article was 
my recommendations of whether these guys should be traded or not be traded. My recommendation for the A's was to trade Mason Miller, but their feeling, and I started this section off by saying that they don't want to do it. They're signaling to clubs that they don't want to do it, and their rationale is, hey, we're tired of losing. We're got, we've got a team now that we're building towards something. Some of our position players are starting to hit. They're 10 and 6 in July. I know it's a small sample, but they're playing better, and they're starting to see some signs of encouragement, and their feeling is, while yes, Mason Miller is a reliever, while yes, he missed almost four months last season, they want to go forward. And by trading Mason Miller for prospects or whatever they might get, they don't believe that they would necessarily be doing that. Now, I disagree. I believe you trade Mason Miller for all the reasons I just said. He's a closer on a bad team. He is a guy with an injury history. His value will never be higher than it is right now, I would imagine not. And this way, while there is some problem in trading him, obviously you're trading this guy, there is a greater risk in keeping him. And they have needs in their rotation. If they could get a top pitching prospect for him, and I believe that they could in this market, teams are always desperate for relievers, top relievers. Top relievers always bring good returns. In that event, I would do it. I don't expect that they're going to do it. Ken, while you were hitting the party scene in Arlington, I was out there grinding. Uh, I know talking to sources, Jim. talking to people. Uh, <laughs> someone recently told me that he, they believe that the Rangers are going to sell. What are your thoughts on it? He thinks they're going to sell everyone because they just cannot wait for DeGrom, Molly, Rocker, Young, Scherzer to come back like, back and, and get enough games in to make a run. So what are your thoughts there? I agree with that. They are going to sell, in my opinion. And I wrote that as much today by basically saying if they're not considering selling, they ought to be, something like that. And the topic of the person I wrote about, well, was Nathan Evaldi. And Nathan Evaldi would be the kind of starting pitcher who every contender would want to have because of his postseason record. This is a guy who has done it in October. Now, getting back to the team itself, for whatever reason, and it's always hard to figure these things out, this team, it just does not seem to be their year. You could say the same thing mostly because of injuries with the Braves, but the Rangers have not played like they played last year. They certainly have not hit like they did last year. Their pitching actually has been pretty good. So if they do decide to sell, they will be a very interesting team, perhaps even the team that kind of controls this deadline along with the White Sox. They've got two relievers on expiring contracts who are really good. Herbie Yates, all-star, David Robertson as well. They've got Evaldi, who has a $20 million vesting player option, but I don't expect that to get in the way of anything. He likely, if he pitches well and is healthy, would simply become a free agent and decline that option. They've got John Gray under control for one more year at $13 million. They can move him, maybe free up some money to sign Evaldi back as a free agent. He is the one guy that might kind of do something like that. He's close with Chris Young. He's from Texas. He, I don't think, would be opposed to coming back if he is traded. And then you have some position players, too, that you could at least dangle. Guys who aren't necessarily having great years. Nathaniel Lowe, Leody Tavares, on and on. There is a good list of players that they could move and retool quickly to add to the young talent that they have and then come back next year with Simeon Seeger, maybe DeGrom and Molly and some others, and they'd be in pretty good shape. What kind of help would it, would it give the Blue Jays in 2025 if they were able to trade Vladdy to a trade market that is starving for position players that are actually well, hitting, not guys that could hit? <laughs> Eric, I'm with you. And... I've been saying that they should trade him. He was one of those in that column that I said should go. And I'm not buying this idea that the Blue Jays seem to be perpetuating that, yeah, we'll come back in 25 and we'll be really good. Why would they think that? They've massively underachieved this year. With this group, this group of players, they're 0-6 in the postseason in this decade. They haven't won a postseason game. So what more do we need to see? Their farm system is not all that good. They, like the Rangers, could retool and do it pretty quickly. And yeah, Vladdy is a guy, of course, you'd want on your team, but they haven't signed Vladdy. He's a guy that has not agreed to an extension. He has one more year after this one. So if you keep him and Bichette and Bassett and some of the other guys who are under control through 25, 
chances are at least Guerrero and Bichette are going to walk. And then where are you? Just accepting draft picks in return? And are you going to win the World Series next year when you're playing in the rugged AL East? I just don't buy this logic at all. This is a guy that, as you said, Eric, could bring you a ton, a ton back. And then you kind of accelerate your building or your retooling, I guess you would call it, in that situation. Ken, we got some fan questions, and one of the fans is a White Sox fan, and his name is Daniel, and I don't know if you think this is as crazy an idea as I do, but he says, not saying it's likely, but could a team trade for Crochet, use him as a reliever or starter, and then flip him again in the offseason when he goes back to salary arbitration? And I'm thinking no, because if you're going to give up the package it's going to take to get him, you're going to want to keep him. But could that possibly happen? AJ, anything is possible, but to me, if you're trading for Garrett Crochet, you're trading for him knowing that in 24, you might not have him as a full-time starter, but that you would in 25 and 26, because he's going to be built up each year, even a little bit more, well, well more than he is this year. So I don't know why a team would do that. And you make a good point there, AJ. You're going to give up a ton for him. You probably won't get the same amount back because now he's getting traded when he is eligible for three pennant races. In the offseason, there'd only be two left. So he wouldn't have the same value then. In my opinion, if you get him, you keep him. All right. Now we're going to go to the Yankees because the Yankees feel like they're always great combo. From A question is from Rakia asked, would you trade Nestor Cortez for an infielder at the trade deadline like Donovan from the Cardinals? It's an interesting thought. I don't know that the Cardinals would do that. Brendan Donovan's a pretty good player. He's got more control, if I'm not mistaken, than Nestor Cortez Jr. does. I don't know that off the top of my head, so if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But to me, the Yankees most likely would prefer to trade prospects for that infielder that we're discussing, keep Cortez in their rotation. Their rotation is really good, but it's not infallible, and I hate trading depth from my rotation. It's a difficult thing to do. You're always one injury away from a problem. I know Clark Schmidt is coming back, and that's something that could maybe help them in the bullpen. So in my view, they should keep their pitching intact. It's been a strength of the team and seek to augment their roster in other ways. All right, Ken, I think we have time for two more. Here's one on the Guardians from Brent on Twitter. With the understanding that Cleveland is generally tight-lipped around the deadline, are there any specific names you can confirm the Guardians are attached to at the moment? And I'll add to this. What do you think goes on with Cleveland right now? Starting pitching for sure, just to help them get through the season, right? Yes, and that's the main thing. And if I knew names, I'd be putting them out there and writing them. <laughs> Obviously, a team like Cleveland is looking at every starting pitcher available whether they do something or not is something that remains to be seen. This is a team that generally is conservative. Now, I say that knowing that in the past, when they've had a chance, they've gone for it. Edwin Encarnacion, they signed him as a free agent. Josh Donaldson, they traded for in August one year. They are not afraid to do things, but they are one of the teams that has had financial issues with its regional sports network, and they didn't do much in the offseason for that reason. So, obviously... Clearly, they need more starting pitching, ideally two more, honestly. But I don't know that they'll be able to do that. They should go for one more. I would expect that they'd be in the rental market. And who are we talking about? Kikuchi and Flaherty, those types. Fetty would be good. He's got another year of control. Maybe that's who they target. I'm not sure exactly which players they're coveting most, but we know the names or at least we think we know the names that are out there. There's always a chance of a surprise. We'll just have to see what they do. But clearly, they're like the Brewers. The Brewers and them, they need starters to get through the season, Scott, just as you said. And Ken, my last one for me is reading the article, I forgot to mention this, about Mason Miller and seeing the Jackson Merrill name thrown out there. Not that it was a current conversation, but you reported that there was an ask there to make a one for one? Well, that's the kind of player that they would want back for Mason Miller. And this was, I guess, before Jackson Merrill really took off, but you can understand the A's wanting a comparable guy. Jackson, uh, Mason Miller has five years left. <laughs> You're gonna have him for a long time. And you would want a young position player or pitcher with the similar amount of control and talent. 
This is a guy who can make a huge, huge difference in a pennant race and in a postseason. So, yes, they did ask for Jackson Merrill at one point for Mason Miller. And I use that example, Scott, to show the kind of talent that they would be looking for. That kind of talent or multiple players who would add up perhaps to that kind of talent. Ken, before we let you go, I have to ask this because people were, first of all, you saw Oakland is going to fire 50% of their staff, which is about what you thought. But the funny part to me is if you go on the 25 schedule when it was released, it doesn't say Sacramento. It just says ATH. So are they moving to Athens? Because I, you know, they, they, and I have fans come up to me and say, I looked at the schedule and it all says ATH. So is it for sure they're going to be in Sacramento? Well, I would imagine, AJ, that's for athletics. But then the question would become if it's Athens, and we're just kidding around here, folks. Athens, Georgia, Athens, Greece, mm. Athens, Ohio. Nice. Maybe somewhere off the face of the earth entirely. No, I don't mm. expect that's going to happen. They'll be in Sacramento, and they'll be sweating a lot in Sacramento. In the oh, summer. yeah. But why didn't they put <laughs> SAC then? Why, why didn't they put SAC? I don't know. I don't know. I don't have an answer there. I kind of know. So, so I mean, I've at least read about it. So we'll talk about it next seg. Let's let Ken get back to They're not going to be identified by a city. Is that what it is? Yeah, yeah. They're not going yeah. to, because it's not permanent. <laughs> that was part of negotiations, apparently, that they were like, yeah, we're not giving you that because we're leaving. So we're not going to attach ourselves to a city that's a temporary home. It's it's weird. We're, we're going to hit the, the employee cuts a little bit coming up next here. But Ken, appreciate the time. We'll catch you on Fair Territory on Thursday. Thanks, guys. Thank you. And you can see that show live right on the Foul Territory YouTube channel, 1230 Eastern Time. Get ready with your questions. Load them up. It will be very, very heavy. Grilling Ken on Thursday with Alana and Ken. We'll be right back. That was awesome, FT fam. We're back. It's Kratz. It's AJ. It's Braun. And we do want to shout out our sponsor today, AG1. Their in-house team of doctors and scientists and researchers with third-party experts on studies that help to validate the benefits of AG1 stand out to us. And that gives you one less thing that you have to research and worry about. And 97% of people in a research study felt more energy after 30 days of drinking AG1. Kratz, you look very alert and well-rested. You might have had a little AG1 to drink this morning already. It's, it's The game's easy. I actually missed my AG1 this morning. Busy morning this morning. I missed a lot of things, but yeah. I you, I notice a difference when I don't have it. Like it's almost like, I know this is weird. It's probably not medically sound, but I yawn more in the mornings that I don't have my AG1 by 10 <laughs> o'clock. Like it sounds so dumb. But it's like something is just something's just a tick off when I don't have it because I've mm -hmm. been consistently taking it. I like that. I, I think you know we need more AG one for Kratz so that he doesn't yawn. That would be <laughs> that would. Be or I just need to take what I have. Yeah, or that. Uh, they're constantly putting their formula to the test. It's trusted by experts and medical professionals, and it's backed by multiple research studies. So. You can see it on the bottom of the screen right now, or if you're listening to the pod, take ownership of your health. Visit drinkag1.com slash foul, or you can hit that QR code. We'll put that QR code up a few more times during the show here, but it's what we recommend here to support whole body health. And you can start your journey with AG1 by getting a free one-year supply of vitamin D3, K2, and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase at drinkag1.com slash foul. Got to go to drinkag1.com slash F-O-U-L. Hey, everybody. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content. We're back here every weekday all year long, so do not miss an episode. The videos are coming in all day. Here's another video you might enjoy. Baseball the way it should be covered.